I thought that um, we would take this liberal schedule that we have this evening and um, kind of talk about some animals, get back to basics a little bit. Cool. We haven't talked about animals in a long, like animals as opposed to animal issues. Right. Animals. Actual animals themselves. We like to do a little bit of animal appreciation here um, at Urban Jungles Radio every now and then. And that's something that I was looking forward to bringing you guys here with the new video show that's coming up. As you may know here at Urban Jungles Radio, we promote diversity in your reptile collection in the likelihood that some animals might, you know, we you know that we have access to currently might not be available or become less and less common for various reasons, including, um, you know, problems affecting them in their habitat and their native range for a lot of animals. Captivity, you know, might unfortunately be the, the only sad option right now because of habitat destruction and just human population growth, which grows rampant, especially in parts of the world where animals inhabit, you know, where they used to be in seclusion, they no longer are. It's very sad. So tonight, I thought that we'd highlight a species that I think deserves some attention yes. due to its beauty and ease. Um, I'm talking about rhino rat snakes tonight, and uh, we're talking about, yay, rhino rat snakes, Rinkophis blengeri, uh, <clears throat> the uh, rhino rat snake that some of you guys may have seen um, in the pet trade. They are becoming more and more common as time goes on. Very unique, very spectacular looking snake. It quickly became one of my favorite favorite species. Um, I thought I'd start off today showing you some babies. We'll pull out some babies that I had bred um, and kind of talk a little bit about their natural history and um, a couple of just important points that you as a keeper might want to consider um, if you're thinking about getting them. So they're very cool. It's a very cool arboreal snake. Of course it's arboreal because, you know, it catches my eye. Um, but <laughs> it's a really cool rat snake. And there's a lot of, I, I learned there's a lot of misinformation on these guys on the internet especially. So let's pull one out. I'm a, I'm a big fan of rat snakes in general. And I, I think once I, once I saw these in your collection, I knew I had to have, had to have one for myself. And um, they are just so, so unique and so cool looking, man. Yeah, they're spectacular species of course you know the first thing you notice on them is the fact that they've got this crazy little face let me see if i can get some highlighting here on our big screen going on um voila here we go, there you go. there's that cute little face um they've got these crazy little faces with these pointy noses and uh let's see if we can kind of settle down here for a bit he's just drinking some water so let's get water out there but there we go so anyway um, that's obviously one of the first things that stand out about this species is these long noses and people like the most common question is what you know what does it serve what purpose does it serve I don't think it serves any purpose um, functionally at least other than breaking up their physical camouflage now a lot of animals um, <clears throat> learn to recognize patterns or learn to recognize silhouettes or just basic shapes and features, um, especially as predators. And so a common thing, a common silhouette that a lot of animals will, will recognize is something that looks a lot like this. You know, it's basically the very typical serpentine motion that you see in snakes, especially in arboreal snakes. You'll see um, they tend to have this, uh, this, this striking pose or position that they'll, they'll favor. So when these snakes take on that, that position that hunting and striking position and they've got these long noses it helps to break up their silhouette a bit more and it helps to make them blend into the trees and leaves so a snake like this could essentially point his face out you know in between a bunch of leaves and because it's not the typical snake shape you won't really pick it up or notice it and that offers him an advantage when hunting especially when hunting prey or avoiding predators too because obviously a snake you know like this size like most babies are going to encounter their fair share of predators for sure so that is i think the primary reason for that pointy nose um you know people might have different opinions on it but i'm pretty sure you know from what i would figure it to be that is the case so they're really interesting too because they go through this um ontogenetic color change um, they're born this color, as you see this baby is kind of this little silvery gray color right now, and they're born this silvery color. And uh, what happens is they go through a change as they mature, and they go from gray to a little bit of an olive color. I've got a slightly older juvenile here. <laughs> a little bit feisty, isn't it? A little it? feisty. Um, and he's slightly different color. I don't know if you'll be able to pick this up on the cameras, but he's a slightly different color and pattern than the other one. And uh, it's because he's latching onto my finger and killing me right now. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and uh, here, let me get it out of the way. Rawr. They don't make the dinosaur noises. Yeah, That's me. One. Here, you take this one. So, okay, so this, I'm going to get this musky smelly one. And he's a little bit older. And it's funny because like, I, one of the things I always preach to people about these snakes is the fact that they um, are super mellow. I mean, you cannot get these animals to strike most of the time. And then, of course, tonight, this guy is like wanting to kill me. Um, let's see if we can get him to respond. It's fine if he does. I don't want to tease him, but there we go. He's just chilling out now, which is good. So um, this species, it's arboreal. It is a rat snake, which means it's super simple to care for. They have slightly different requirements than typical rat snakes, um, mostly in the way of temperature and that they don't like it very warm. Um, this is a species that occurs up in the montane regions of China, Vietnam, um, and it occurs at high elevations and usually, usually found in streams and valleys, regions. It's, very, it's always associated with water. They're, they're often found associ closely associated with water, which you can see in their captive husbandry because one of the downsides, if any, to this species is the fact that when they're born, they're born fairly small, about the size of garter snakes, um, for those of you who are familiar with that size range. Um, but they are um, small and they have a preference of feeding on ectothermic prey, that is on feeding on cold-blooded things, things like lizards and frogs, which can be a pain. Um, I do not ever feed them lizards or frogs, mostly because of parasite issues. It's really easy to transmit parasites um, between these animals when you're feeding that kind of a prey item to them. So what I do is I hold out and give them um, minnows, feeder fish. They take very well to feeder fish, just like a garter snake would, and it's kind of the same deal feeding them. Um, when they're babies, after their first shed, just like any typical colubrid, I will set them up with a shallow dish of water and feeder guppies in it. Nine times out of ten, they will usually take it right off the bat on their own. Uh, sometimes you might have to wait them out a little bit, but they will eventually just turn around and take the guppies. And They'll do that, and as they do that, they develop a tremendous feeding response. Um, these animals love to eat, and so they become more and more aggressive feeders, especially on the minnows. And once they reach a certain size, it becomes very easy to switch them over to pinkies. What I usually do is I'll take a thawed pinky and um, just throw it in the water with the fish, with the minnows. And in their excitement, they'll usually end up grabbing the pinky and then they associate it with food. And two or three meals later, they'll take the pinky, you know, by tease feeding it to them without any real major effort whatsoever. Very simple snake. And then once they get feeding on rodents, they just grow super fast. They're pretty awesome in that way. They grow really quick. So um, an all around fun species. They require cooler temperatures, a little more moisture, but I generally keep mine just like I keep Amazon tree boas. I keep them temperature range, um, usually no higher than the low to mid 80s. And they actually prefer the much cooler side. In the winter time, I will brumate them just like most normal rat snakes, except that I don't shut them down quite as much. I just shut down all of their heats and lights and leave them in the cage. I don't necessarily put them in a cooling area or anything. So they'll probably hover in the mid 60s for most of the winter. Um, ambient maybe cool down a little more on their own and uh, from there they will do great and um, as adults they're really spectacular let me take this little baby back from Randy and let's pull an adult out do you think they need the brumation I think they do um, not for health reasons or anything but I think that just like most typical colubrids the males need a cooling period mm -hmm. to stimulate uh, the get the production of sperm and you know gamete production um, which, of course, ensures for successful breedings later on, if, if that's what you want to do, if you want to breed them. And anyone knows that you need successful gametes to be produced. <laughs> Succeed with your gametes, people. So anyway, um, I'm going to whip out an adult now. And this is just a spectacular snake. Now, you saw the little drab brown, green, I mean, uh, olive-colored babies. Now, the adults. Take it out slowly. The gorilla's getting a little nervous. So. It's okay, gorilla. Don't worry. I know the gorillas have a natural tendency to stay away from snakes. Woo! Here he comes natural aversion to natural him. aversion to snakes and but but not to be uh not to be worried okay so here is this is an adult male rhino rat snake um this is one of my breeder animals let's see if we can ooh, uh, he doesn't like the ipad very much there no go. wow that's nice nice let's see if we can get him to focus a little better on you yeah so um there we go there you go so um here's an adult and you can see they have this beautiful green coloration they're really spectacular actually i think this is my female 
Um, mm-hmm. This is the female. Mm-hmm. And um, they have this really cool bluish coloration in between the scales. So they're really beautiful, bright green snakes with this long, pointy face. A very unique look. Now, as I said, um, as mature animals, they are super easy, just basically like any other rat snake or, or you know, any of the, the rat snake kin. Um, they will feed on rodents throughout the year, even when they're being cooled. Um, if you give it to them, I prefer not to feed them, obviously, because they're, they're not at prime digestion. Uh, optimal digestive temperatures and, and conditions so I, I usually don't feed them but they will just continue on they are really easy you you can't keep them too cold um, some of them have been known to seek out temperatures in the 50s on purpose and just kind of lounge in there um, they're really spectacular snakes as, as adults and I mean there's just there's nothing out there that looks quite like one and the one thing that's really cool about them is they're probably one of the most visual snakes I've ever seen they are very visually aware of everything. Um, they're always watching, even in their cage. Um, they're always watching me and like, watching. Like a lot of rat snakes, they're they're really intelligent for you know snakes. Yeah, for colubrids, which are generally considered not like very evolved kind of species, they are very intelligent, very watchful. Now, what's cool about this species is it makes a really amazing display species. Um, they are not as prone to hiding in dark places like most other rat snakes. They'll gladly display out a lot like a tree boa. They'll sit up on a branch right out in the open and bask and they're beautiful and they're not shy and they'll watch you and you watch them they're very interactive animals um really spectacular species they are still relatively uncommon in the pet trade they still fetch a little bit of a high price but that's coming down they're becoming more readily available i highly recommend you obtain at least a pair of these animals in your collection because they're just so easy they're so beautiful they will open up communication even amongst people who are not fans of reptiles they'll see this and be like wow that's really cool looking and it's a really good ambassador to reptile keeping as a whole so a species i wholeheartedly recommend super easy um, becoming more and more readily available and of course absolutely gorgeous as you guys can see um, really no downside except for the whole feeding issue when they're newborn so if you go ahead and get yourself a juvenile you won't have to deal with that and i promise it's totally worth it um, even as babies, they're, they're very easy to go. I've been breeding them for about two years now, and I absolutely love them. They're spectacular. Yeah, that's my that's kind of my aversion to the, the young ones. I mean, I, I love the adult colors, and I love how the, the color changes from baby to adult. But yeah, I, I got to uh, kind of agree with that statement that uh, it's an aversion for me to deal with something that is kind of uh, prey-specific mm-hmm. that I'm not accustomed to feeding. Like the feeder fish. Like feeder fish, you know, and, and I know fish can, you know, carry so many other diseases too that, you know, you want, you definitely want to feed them a healthy prey item. Yeah, you know, it's not even the, the fish that carry diseases as much as the fact, unfortunately, that a lot of fish are treated with um, chemical, ah, I oh. just got scared and bit me because my iPad fell. Sorry. Okay. You got it? Yeah, I got it. All right. Now. <laughs> He's going to kill me now. She's going to destroy <laughs> you, man. Anyway. Um. Yeah, the thing, the, the trick about fish is is the fact that the fish are often treated with a lot of chemicals, mm-hmm. um, like the blue water that you see in Petland and Petco, and right, it's antiparasitic, stress, code, whatever. They put in a, just a million different things: methylene blue, um, antibacterials, all kinds of stuff, and that stuff you know bioaccumulates in the fish that you're feeding to your snake. So when you're feeding your snake a diet of fish, you don't want to feed it something that has been sitting in antibiotics all the time because your snake is going to absorb those antibiotics into its system, which it probably doesn't need. Um, And then when there does come a point that you need it, you're going to have problems. You're going to come up with resistant strains of issues and all kinds of nasty stuff. So um, you definitely want to be careful with the fish. Now, one of the things I I remedied with that is um, feeding some of the less commercially available fish, like um, minnows that we can get from a little mom and pop shop near me. Um, also, mollies are a really good substitute. They're cheap. They breed like crazy. You can buy pregnant ones really cheap, yeah, and they spat yeah. out babies. Um, it's always good to keep like you know a dozen female mollies around and just let them pop babies out. And that's a really easy food source too that I've exploited in the past. Um, you know, there's a, a good. I like that options. idea. That's a good idea with the mollies. Yeah, I used to do that a lot, especially when I had my um, the aquatic snake, the uh, the elephant trunk the elephant snake. Trunk, yeah, because yeah, I hate feeding goldfish. Never ever feed Mm-mm. goldfish if you can avoid. Goldfish it. are horrible, and I think rosies are probably next horrible. Yeah, rosies are next bad. And the problem with the goldfish is that um, not only do they have a wicked spine on them, which a lot of people don't realize, but they do. They are probably one of the most heavily lead, mercury laden you know animals out there. They're pretty horrible so definitely not something that you want to be feeding to your precious little snake i mean look at that face he's so cute 
How can you say no to that? Anyway, easy snakes. Just totally to let you know, we're, we're pissing people off because there's no you stream. So you all can't their, see yeah, this it's, beautiful animal here sitting with us right now just next to my face about to kill me. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and here, let me see if I can get one more big visual shot here for the big screen. Uh, so you guys can appreciate it at home. Clear scene off. Yes. And that, my jungle junkies, is the quick and dirty on rhino rat snakes. If you have any questions, please feel free to hit me up. Um, we'll definitely try to answer anything. Woo, you may have. <laughs> Don't kill me. Now, there's something we were, we were talking about um, before the show began, that um, you had a theory as far as um, sexual dimorphism in rhino rats. Yes, I'm going to share my theory with you, okay? That's why let's I brought it up. Can get, let's see if we can get a good angle here to show you. Okay, good angle. All right, so... I believe that this species is sexually dimorphic. Now, I haven't seen enough variations, especially in localities, and there seems to be a lot of color variations um, in this species as well. But so far, from what I've seen of my own snakes and other people's snakes as well, it would seem that there's a bit of sexual dimorphism in them in the way in their faces. Let me see if I can get a close-up. Here we go. Now, you can see this animal has almost no contrast between the top of that black line running across its eye and the bottom of the black line running across its eye. It's basically green above and green below. Um, this tends to be the case in females mostly. Um, the females tend to have really bland colored faces, these kind of unicolor faces. Males have a huge contrast in between the top of the color of that stripe and the lower color of that stripe. Usually males tend to be very cream or like an off-white buff color. Um, underneath their eyes and around their chin, whereas the females will usually just kind of be green or bluish around and have no contrast. So I'm pretty sure that's a, a, a good way to tell them apart. Um, I, like I said, I haven't been able to confirm it yet because I haven't seen, I mean, this animal occurs over a huge range. And unfortunately, a lot of the representatives that we're seeing probably, you know, only come from a small portion of their overall range. I'm sure there's colors and all kinds of cool things that we haven't even seen in them yet. So... Um, as time goes on, we'll be able to prove that. But yeah, I'm pretty sure their faces are sexually dimorphic. You can look at the contrast on their faces and, uh, and usually tell them. So far, it hasn't let me down, but we'll see. Does that answer your question, Andy? That's excellent. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. And it's been a pleasure to bring you our little first segment on a cool snake species. I hope you guys will consider them. They're very cool. You won't be disappointed, for sure. I, I highly suggest getting uh, a pair for yourself. I really do. I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got one. I've got a juvie right now. I think it's a male. Right. So d as soon as I can find a nice, uh, you know, sub-adult female, I'm definitely going to pick one up. If we were at Tinley this year, that would have happened. Or I should say this, this time. We'll be there in October. I guarantee friggin it. We will be there next time for sure because um, there's, there's no way we can, we can sit them out again, Andy. No, okay. absolutely not. I mean, we've, we've been to three. This is the first one that we've missed. And uh, I don't know what you're doing. I'm just putting up on screen. Oh, okay. There's Andy. Oh, Chicago Reptile House repping. Woo! -hoo. That's right. Yeah. Um. Even okay, Potter, hook us up, baby. <laughs> Payback, Potter. We've been repping for you. No. Um. Yeah. Good stuff. So you know, pick them up, and uh, we're just going on now. <laughs> I highly, I highly suggest it. I, do do, I really do. Yeah. Do you really? Yeah, I do. Shit up at the pet shop. Ectothermic and so damn frosty. The people like, damn, that's a cold ass honky.